Good evening and welcome. My name is Christine Nelson and I am the Fellowships Manager at the Library Company of Philadelphia and I want to welcome you tonight to our fireside chat. I am joining you from my home in West Philadelphia this evening um, and I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Zachary Schrag. Um, sorry, just a few technical difficulties, but I'm good now. Uh, Zach is a professor of history and art history at George Mason University, and he studies cities, technology, and public policy in the United States over three centuries, the 19th, 20th, and into the 21st century. So quite a broad time period and range of interests. Zach has been a regular researcher at the library company, and we are grateful that he's with us tonight to talk not just about his scholarship, but about his ways of working and about historians' ways of working and interacting with the kinds of resources that we make available at the library company. Zach has published widely in many venues, including the Journal of Policy History, the Journal of Urban History, as well as Slate, Washington Monthly, and the Washington Post, and many, many more. His broad interests are reflected in the subjects of his four books, the first was a study of a major and relatively recently built transit system that many of us have made use of. The book is entitled The Great Society Subway, A History of the Washington Metro. His second book, entitled Ethical Imperialism, was a study of institutional review boards and their impact on the research on research in humanities and social sciences from 1965 to 2009. Tonight, he is going to take us back well over a century to a time of concentrated violence here in Philadelphia during the mid-1840s. And this is the subject of one of, his, one of his two new books, The Fires of Philadelphia, Citizen Soldiers, Nativists, and the 1844 Riots Over the Soul of a Nation. His other new book, which I'm very much looking forward to reading and learning from, is the Princeton Guide to Historical Research. And we will hear in a moment how he himself practiced the research methods that he outlines in the new Princeton Guide. So a few practical notes for tonight. If you feel you would benefit from captioning, you should be able to turn that on, uh, turn that function on by uh, clicking on the button marked live transcript. My colleague Blanche Brown is running this event behind the scenes, though you don't see her on screen. So thank you, Blanche. And she will be sharing some useful notes in the chat, including um, some discount codes that will allow you to purchase Zach's new books. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to enter them in the chat box at any time during the talk, and we will do our best to address them at the end of the program. So I am very happy now to introduce Dr. Zachary Schreg. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very honored to be here tonight. Um, so as you've all heard, I've uh, written two books that were published in 2021. Uh, the first one, uh, The Princeton Guide to Historical Research, which is a guide to how to do history yourself, uh, going from anywhere from sixth grade students doing National History Day projects uh, through graduate school and beyond. And the second one, The Fires of Philadelphia, which uh, is maybe more in line with some of the previous segments in the series, uh, showcasing the history of early America, and in my case, uh, drawing in part on the wonderful holdings at the Library Company of Philadelphia. So given that, I especially want to thank uh, some of the staff there, uh, Cornelia King, Emily Smith, and Sarah Weatherwax at the Library Company gave me a great deal of help with the research. And of course, uh, Blanche Brown and Christine Nelson and Will Fenton for arranging and hosting this evening's talk. So a basic premise of the Princeton Guide to Historical Research is that any historical project, like most human projects, can be pretty daunting if you try to think about it all at once, but becomes more manageable if you break it down into smaller tasks. And so I've broken the book down into five major parts, uh, starting with some definitions of history, and then uh, addressing four major skills of the historian, posing questions, finding sources, managing research projects, and telling stories. So in this talk tonight, what I'd like to do is describe each of these skills, drawing uh, from my experience writing The Fires of Philadelphia, as well as some of my other projects, and the many, many historians whose work I explored in the process of writing the Princeton Guide. 
And I will emphasize here that I didn't try to overly impose my own views on how to do things as much as to extract from others uh, how they write history and try to find some shared themes and values. The first challenge in writing the book was to try to figure out what history even means, because uh, there have been competing definitions and I think some confusion as well. Uh, most definitions of history say something about the past. Uh, Charles Beard called history contemporary thought about the past. Conyers Reed described history as the memory recorded or unrecorded of past human experience. Um, Mark Bloch called it the science of men in time. Uh, so pretty much people agree that history is something to do with the study of the past. But I don't think that's precise enough. And so I, I offer in the book a more precise definition, which is history is the study of people and the choices they made in the past. And this gets me into a little bit of controversy uh, with some historians. You've got some folks who think that, well, really the past has got more than people in it. Uh, historians of technology mention artifacts, machinery, environmental historians talk about animals and plants and even rocks having a history. And, and that's true. Um, but if you actually look at their books, if you open up a work of environmental history, most of that book is about people. And I think that's how it should be. That's the, how you know the difference between a historian and a geologist or a paleontologist or an engineer is that historians are thinking about the interactions between people and these non-human objects or uh, organisms or geological forces. And uh, so really they, they do write about history um, as the subject, as uh, the study of people. And then it's also not just that there were people there, it's that people did things. Uh, some people uh, took action, uh, whether in politics or war or business, other people thought things and, and chose how to attribute meaning to different ideas. But history is fundamentally about what people chose and what they chose not to do, uh, why they chose this idea over this other idea, why they adopted this policy and not the other one. Uh, of course, humans are not completely free to do this. Uh, Marx, Karl Marx probably said it best when he said, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves. Um, and uh, I think that's you know, a pretty good rule um, today is to think about what choices were open to people, what choices were not open to people and uh, how they made choices given under the, given the circumstances into which they were born. Once we get past that definition, history is the study of people and the choices they made. We can think about how historians approach this as a set of virtues or ideals to aspire to. Uh, the first one is curiosity. If you're not curious about people and choices they made, you're not going to be a good scholar. Uh, that's probably applicable to all fields of scholarship. And uh, that may sound obvious, but unfortunately there are some people who go into the study of the past trying to prove something that they already believe. Here's what I believe, now I'm gonna go look for evidence to support that claim. And that's the wrong way to do it. Um, historians need to be open to surprises. Uh, the best projects I think come when historians ask, why did this happen? And really don't know the answer to that question. They may have a hunch, but maybe they don't know at all. Uh, again, if you're trying to prove something uh, that you already think is true, you're subject to what people call confirmation bias. You're only going to look at evidence that helps you throw out the evidence that doesn't. And this is how historians get into ruts, how generations of male historians convince themselves that women weren't important or how generations of white historians downplayed the history of slavery. The second virtue is accuracy. Again, sounds pretty promising, right? You want historians to get their facts right. Um, in practice, historians know that they make mistakes. Uh, I've made mistakes. I've, I've had them pointed out to me already in the Philadelphia book, which is frustrating, but you know, there it goes. Uh, what we try not to do is to make too many mistakes. If you talk to engineers, uh, they talk about tolerances. It's not that the two pieces have to fit together exactly, it's that they have to fit together well enough. And if you're designing something to be airtight, like in a space station, then their two pieces are gonna have to fit together a lot better than uh, just having something say on a piece of luggage. 
Um, so similarly, historians need to have enough accuracy in their work. Um, Richard White put this very well when he, say, he said, uh, historians aspire to tell the truth, but we usually settle for avoiding known falsehoods, trying not to make unsubstantiated claims and providing evidence for what we say so that others can check themselves. Once you have those facts or what you believe to be the facts, then the third virtue is that of judgment. Uh, and again, this is something that I think may uh, distinguish history from other fields of uh, scholarship. If you talk to uh, people in medicine, of course, uh, they will say, well, the first uh, order is to do no harm. That comes from Hippocrates. Uh, but historians don't take the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, when we see that people in the past made bad choices that hurt other people, uh, we tend to say so. Um, and this is a long tradition, again, going at least far back as the Roman historian Tacitus. On the other hand, uh, we don't want it to turn people into cartoon villains. If your people in your story are always heroic or always villainous, uh, then they're probably not really people anymore. You've probably exaggerated their good points or their bad points. And so uh, what we try to do in holding people to account is do that for specific de decisions that they made and not uh, necessarily castigate those people entirely. Uh, this ties into a fourth virtue, which is empathy, trying to see the world through the eyes of people in the past. And uh, in their uh, 2016 book about Thomas Jefferson, the most blessed of the patriarchs, Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf said this beautifully. They said, we seek to understand what Thomas Jefferson thought he was doing in the world. Not that they liked it, right? Thomas Jefferson did some really good things and some really terrible things, but they were trying to understand what he thought he was doing. And that's often the historian's job is to empathize with uh, historical characters enough so that you get to know them and can explain what they were trying to do, even if you don't share their values. The fifth virtue I cite is gratitude. Uh, there is uh, certainly a well-founded stereotype of historians working long solitary hours on their research and writing. Um, historians are different from many of our colleagues in the university in that we uh, publish a lot of work under one name, um, as opposed to the uh, multi-authored uh, collaborations by scientists and law professors and economists and others. But we actually work with a lot of other people at the same time. Uh, other scholars, co-authors, funders, librarians and archivists, of course, uh, editors, publishers, peer reviewers, and ultimately readers. And so, you know, we are always uh, bound to, and I hope appropriately grateful to wonderful places like the Library of Company of Philadelphia that allow us to do our work, that preserve the sources that we need. And uh, I think we owe these places more than a mere thank you. We need to uh, make our work as accessible as we can. Uh, sometimes that means keeping the cost low for published work. Sometimes that means sharing open source information. Sometimes that means giving public talks. Sometimes that just means writing well so more people can understand what we're saying. But historians do consume a lot of resources, not as many as you know, uh, nuclear engineers, but um, a fair number. And I think it's our job to share our findings as broadly as possible. And then finally, I think we need to keep our eye on the truth. And this is more than just factual accuracy. This is you know, really telling the story as best we understand it. And I say this because the opposite of historical knowledge is not historical ignorance. The opposite of historical knowledge is deliberate falsehood. If you think about George Orwell's novel, 1984, and Winston Smith's job, it's not just to cut things out of the newspaper, it's to replace them with wholly fictitious accounts of this endless war in a way that makes people forget that there even was an erasure. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, these uh, historians need to fight back against the myths, uh, however comforting, that obscure real understanding of the past. Uh, we have, again, in the study of American slavery, magnificent work that's been going on for generations, um, trying to understand the experience of enslaved people, the motivations of the people who enslaved them, the effects of this on the world economy, um, all kinds of questions about slavery, the end of slavery. And this is not mostly, I would say, an attack on ignorance. It's mostly an attack on Gone with the Wind, which very deliberately put out uh, myths about 
uh, slavery being a you know relatively benign institution and Reconstruction being some kind of horror, um, going back before that, of course, birth of a nation. So historians are there uh, not to merely to fight ignorance, but also to fight myth. Now, uh, again, these are all ideals. Uh, I've done my best to live up to them, even when I know I can't achieve them uh, in, in perfectly. Uh, one big challenge with the Philadelphia book was that I was in fact writing about some pretty horrible people. Um, these nativists who uh, you know, eventually attacked Irish American uh, neighborhoods and burned uh, Catholic churches. And not only did I dislike these people and, and despise their values, I also found them dishonest. Uh, they, in their newspapers, they would write over and over again about how tolerant they were and how they didn't want to disparage anyone's religion. And then the very next line, they would say something horrible about Catholicism. Um, and so, you know, uh, that was pretty hard for me. Uh, I also found the challenge of uh, having eyewitness accounts that were just completely incompatible. People saying, you know, very different things about the order in which events occurred or what people said. Uh, there were a couple cases in the book where I just said, look, here are two different accounts and here's why I believe this one. If I did that every time two accounts differed, uh, the book would just be boring because that would have been, you know, every paragraph. Oh, here's another possibility. Um, so I, I, I gave him my best judgment um, in trying to uh, give a generally truthful account of the events. So those are the virtues of the historian. Once you have those in mind, how do you actually go about the project? Uh, the first challenge for the historian, uh, not the hardest, but probably the most important, is to ask a good question. And if you've asked previous uh, episodes in the series of Fireside Chats, uh, you've probably heard some historians explain how they came to their topic. And, and I love these stories. I mean, it's like, you know, seeing a couple in love and saying, oh, how did you meet? You know, tell me, you know, when did you first see them, right? Um, it's wonderful to hear historians how they came to their topics. Um, and they're, they're often wonderful and surprising stories. Uh, no two stories are alike, but I do see uh, patterns uh, and this is, again, one of the historian's jobs is to take a lot of events and see the patterns. And I see uh, three strategies in particular that are useful. Uh, and again, this goes back, you know, even to middle high school students can use some of these strategies. Uh, the first one is uh, something that the literary scholars call narrative expansion, which is a fancy way of saying what happened before or what happened next or what happened to the other people in that story. Uh, if you think about the Star Wars franchise, right, you have the original story and then, oh, what happened before? Let's make some movies about Anakin before he became Darth Vader. And, oh, what happened after? Let's get, you know, Daisy Ridley um, in the generation after um, Luke and Leia. Or what happened during? And that's how you get, um, you know, Rogue, Rogue One, was it? Whatever that movie was. Um, and you see this uh, with, you know, a lot of uh, movie franchises. Uh, historians do this all the time as well. So if you think about the American Revolution, as uh, many library company viewers may, you may think about events in Boston, you may think about Philadelphia, um, you might think about Yorktown, but you might not think about what was going on on the Gulf Coast um, uh, along the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, Kath Kathleen Duval thought about that, and she wrote this wonderful book about the Floridas, Louisiana, and what was going on uh, there while George Washington was doing all of his stuff um, up in, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So she, she retells the story from a different place, but at the same time. And that's a great example of narrative expansion. Uh, again, you could tell the same story with different characters if you have the sources. You could tell the same story um, using different methods. A second strategy that I looked at is uh, what I call everything has a history. Uh, it comes from Jim Grossman at the American Historical Association. Uh, a really good example of this are the food histories that have been very popular uh, for some decades now, ever since the book on cod came out, I, I think as Mark Kolansky, um, we have, you know, anything in your house, right? Bananas, coffee, chocolate, there's a history of it now. Um, and we can also think about that in terms of institutions. So I grew up riding the Washington Metro. I wanted to know where did that come from? Went to the library, looked for a book. It wasn't there, so I wrote it. Um, and uh, we can also think about even things like behaviors. My colleague, Peter Stearns, uh, writes about the history of emotions. So this thing called shame, you know, that's got a history. Uh, how far can we trace it back? Um, histories of rearing children or giving birth to children. Um, any histories of sports, anything that exists now in the present has a history and that's a potential uh, subject of research. 
And then the third strategy that I emphasize is autobiography. And again, this, this blends into the other ones as well. Uh, if uh, you ride bicycles, you might be interested in the history of bicycles. Um, you know, some historians write about events they've experienced themselves. Uh, my late colleague, Marty Sherwin, uh, was in the Navy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and his last book was about the Cuban Missile Crisis writ large. Um, others write about uh, family members sometimes, uh, ancestors. Some of them people write about just people who were like them in the past. And this is a great way, again, especially for students, but even for professional historians, to come across topics is to you know, say, who would I have been 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and write about those folks? So my book on Philadelphia was really a combination of all three of these. Uh, I was interested in urban riots in part because of current events. Um, we this, I started this well before the big wave of protests around uh, the killing of George Floyd, but there had been uh, the World Bank protests uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. I had been to anti-war marches um, in various wars um, and uh, other urban violence. So I was you know, interested in what that was like. Um, so a bit of autobiography there, a bit of current events. Um, and then I also ended up somewhat unintentionally doing a narrative expansion where my original plan was to write more about 20th century urban violence, uh, especially in the 1960s. But then I thought, well, I should learn a little bit about the 19th century to figure out what came before and why it was, for example, that National Guard troops were being called out to patrol American cities. Well, once you ask that question, what is it, why is it the citizen soldier, the National Guard, who gets called out to riot duty, suddenly you're in the 1830s and 1840s. And uh, that led me to Philadelphia in 1844 in particular. So in a sense, uh, it is a book about the 1960s, even though it's a book about the 1840s as well. Um, all of this gets you to a topic, but I wanna emphasize that a topic is not a question. Uh, to get to a question, you need to ask not only what happened, but why it happened. And better still, why did people do something that you didn't expect them to do? Uh, there's a the famous newspaper uh, adage, right? If, if a dog bites a man, that's not a story. If a man bites a dog, that's a story. People weren't expecting that. They wanna know why the man bit the dog. And uh, we can see this in a lot of strategies deployed by historians. Um, they're looking at uh, a conflict, uh, how it was resolved. They're looking at people doing something uh, you didn't expect them to do. It might be uh, people trying to decide among competing priorities. And all of those are what I term dialectics, where there's some kind of tension that needs to be resolved in the story. So beyond the, the specifics of Philadelphia in 1844, I was wrestling with, I think, a, a longer standing tension in American democracy, which is the tension between liberty and order. If you ask people in the 1840s or now, uh, would you like American cities to be patrolled by troops with fixed bayonets uh, telling people to go home? Uh, they're probably gonna say, no, that, that doesn't really sound very American uh, to have our, our streets run by troops. And then if you ask them, well, what if, uh, what these troops are doing is trying to keep a crowd of thousands of angry, possibly drunken, rowdy teenage boys from burning a church. Then you might think, well, how bad are these bayonets? Uh, maybe we could have a few bayonets on the street, right? Um, and in fact, some level of civic order is necessary to preserve American freedom. And that's the tension that you see in Philadelphia in 1844. That's the tension you see uh, in fights in 2020 uh, and 2021. Um, and it's, it's a really big, hard, unanswerable tension, uh, that dialectic between uh, liberty and order. And all of this feeds into, I think, the, what I call sort of the grand dialectic of history, which is before and after. Um, how do things change over time? So um, Having that big idea is what turns a, a topic into a question. And then once you have that question, why did Philadelphians turn to violence? Why did they turn away from violence? Then you can start answering those questions. Now, in order to do that, you need sources. Uh, other fields, uh, again, I think of the sciences, economics, uh, they, they have data, historians have sources. And uh, those sources can be all kinds of things. Uh, they are very often textual documents. They can also be images. They can be artifacts. Uh, they can be places. They can be people to interview. But any kind of historical research project is a marriage 
uh, between questions and sources. Um, there are lots of great questions out there that we probably will never be able to answer at all. Others uh, take a lot of ingenuity to answer. And again, this is where we get back into the stories. And I, I said, you know, historians coming to their topic, that's how did you meet your, your love. Uh, the uh, discussion of sources is more about courtship. How did you win their heart? And uh, again, I love these source, these source stories as well. Um, and a lot of these take place in archives. And uh, if you've never been into an archive, you can think about it as a kind of hyper library. Uh, a library is a place where they have books that you don't own, right? So you go there to borrow them or to read them in the library. An archive is often a place where they have materials that no one else owns, unique materials, manuscripts, or rare books, or something that no one else in the world has, or very few places have. Uh, and so they come out with a lot of rules, right? In a regular library, you can't uh, eat, but sometimes they'll let you get away with a water bottle. Don't try that in an archive. No, 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 no food, no drink, we mean it. Uh, regular library, you're not allowed to write in the books. Uh, in an archive, you can't even bring in a pen. It might leak unintentionally, and uh, again, mar a, an irreplaceable document. And uh, archives are also, you know, pretty good about the no talking rule. Uh, there are a couple sounds that you will hear in archive. One is the, the clicking of digital cameras, and I'll get to that in a little bit. And, and the other sound you'll hear sometime is a kind of <laughs> and that <laughs> means that a historian has opened up a folder or a box and seen something they were not expecting that they know is going to change their project. And uh, let me uh, give an example of this uh, from the library company. Let me share screen. Uh, this was from a couple years ago. And let's make sure I have it. Uh, I, I opened up a folder uh, and I saw this image. And I was not expecting to see any kind of illustration. And I, I knew I was looking for this newspaper and um, I'd seen a reference to it in another newspaper and uh, Mason librarian, uh, George Oberly helped me locate it at the library company, there it was. But I really was not expecting to see an illustration showing a crucial event in the history I was writing about. Most better still, uh, what's extremely unusual about this illustration, the only one I found, is that the people uh, depicted doing the rioting are actually drawn in a fair amount of detail. Uh, there are a lot of scenes of the Philadelphia riots where you see these tiny little sort of stick figures in a big crowd. But this artist uh, was trying to show these uh, people, in this case, Irish immigrants, as these crude ruffians. Uh, if you can see, they've got their shirt sleeves rolled up. They're not wearing proper jackets, right? You know, they're not uh, proper gentlemen. They're wearing caps instead of good hats. And they are seizing the flag away from this proper Philadelphian with his top hat and frock coat. And I just you know, had no idea that this had even been illustrated. Um, it's better quality than most of the illustrations of the 1840s. And uh, so, you know, the archivists, of course, run over and say, what did you find? And they're very happy to know that a researcher has found something so astonishing. Um, and they were even uh, kind enough to let me uh, write about this in a blog post for the library company. Uh, so, you know, that's one way that historians tell their story is, oh, yeah, you know, I opened up this box and, you know, here was this thing. In this case, um, you know, not something that a lot of historians had had access to before. It was only acquired by the library company in 2013, thanks to a generous donation. Um, and so that's, you know, one great kind of story. The other kind of story, though, is the one that historians really like is, is where uh, someone, the source is out there. But a historian comes with a new set of questions and poses them to a familiar source. And the great example of this is uh, Laura Th Laurel Thatcher Ulrich and her book, A Midwife's Tale, um, much beloved by many historians. Uh, and that is based very heavily on a single source, a, a decades long diary by a midwife named Martha Ballard. And that diary had been sitting for all to see in the main state library for around half a century uh, before Laurel Thatcher Ulrich looked at it. But she was the one who really thought about, OK, we've got these very sparse entries, but if I can see some patterns and combine it with my other knowledge of early American women's history, um, I can turn it into a gripping narrative. And that's what she did. And that's why historians honor her in that book so much, is that she took a source and made it really sing because she had the right questions. <laughs>
Okay, so once you have the questions and the sources, what do you do with that? Uh, the next stage is project management. And a big part of the Princeton Guide to Historical Research is kind of step-by-step, -step, here's how you use different sources, here's how you take notes, here's how you work in the library, here's how you find sources. I, I don't have time to go in, into all of that, um, but I thought I might comment here on one question that I do get asked a lot, which is how is historical research changing uh, in the wake of new digital technologies? And uh, this is something that has been talked about for a uh, good quarter of a century now. Um, my own institution, George Mason University, is home to the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, uh, which is one of the pioneering institutions in the field of digital history. Um, and uh, you know, one of the questions that Roy and his successors have asked is, will digital technologies revolutionize the field? And uh, my own feeling on this, and again, not everyone would agree, is that uh, the technologies have been important, but less revolutionary than we might've expected from the most starry rhetoric of the 1990s. Uh, most of the work that I consume, books I really love to read and articles and public history installations uh, come less from new technology and more from new questions. Uh, so historians trying to compare the United States uh, with other countries in the world, for example, or think about interactions between America and the world or other kinds of engagement with intellectual debates of our times. Um, those are you know, questions that are new, but the uh, methods are older. Um, that said, uh, there are um, a couple of technologies that I think um, do matter a lot to historians these days. Uh, one is one that I, I used in the library company of Philadelphia, which is the digital camera. Um, in the old days, uh, when I was starting out, uh, we had photocopies, if you remember those, um, and you could also sometimes bring a film camera, but those were very expensive uh, to use. You could you know, spend anywhere from 10 cents to a page to 50 cents to photograph a slide, and so you used them sparingly, and and with archival work, you generally can't use an actual photocopier because of the bright light might damage the materials. So mostly historians spend a lot of time in the archives taking notes while in the presence of the documents. Uh, these days, again, it's very common to see historians go into an archive with a camera uh, or a smartphone and take hundreds or thousands of images in a week and then leave. And then when they have time at home, pull up those images on their monitors and work that way. And uh, this has really empowered a lot of historical research. Um, those of us with job or family responsibilities who much as we might like to spend months or years uh, away from home um, are now able, uh, if we're not, we are now able to make these quicker raids uh, to other cities. And I was able to travel up and down the coast of the United States, uh, finding different materials related to my research and then come home and, and take care of my kids. Um, so this has been, uh, pretty important. Again, um, I think for the Philadelphia Project, I took more than 20,000 digital photographs of newspapers and documents and other kinds of sources, um, far more than you know, I ever would have made uh, photocopies or, um, or scans. So that's sort of individual level digitization of sources. Um, then there's the macro level of enormous digitization projects, uh, some of them done by nonprofits, uh, some of them done by for-profit corporations. Uh, most famously, Google uh, did the huge Google Books project, which is nice if you're a 20th century historian, you get little snippets of the texts in books published uh, that may still be in copyright. If you're a historian in the 19th century, it's amazing because all kinds of books uh, that are now in the public domain because they're sufficiently old are available as full text resources, resources and searchable in Google or projects like that, Happy Trust. Um, and you can find things about people that you never would have found before. And then there are the newspapers. Again, some of them like Chronicling America at the Library of Congress are open to all. Others require subscription um, because they're coming from commercial companies. But um, you know, very obscure people who you never could find suddenly pop up. I have people involved in the riots and I would type in their names and oh, here's something you know, nasty that they did five years before the riots in 1839 that I never would have you know, found that particular page on that, that particular newspaper. But now I have this, this little punk you know, rap sheet essentially. Um, oh yes, this was not his first fight. Or, oh, he was a member of this 
Philadelphia Fire Company that was known for brawling. Um, or you can find out, you know, if uh, someone died decades later, right? You get their obituary. It said, oh, you know, you thought they might have been killed in the riots. No, they lived. Or, you know, here's, um, you know, something about them that I could figure out. So that mass digitization um, has been very important. But, you know, in terms of the day-to-day -day note taking, I'll just show one more image here. Um, oh, I didn't turn that one off. Uh, uh, since I mentioned my colleague, uh, Roy Rosenzweig, I had the pleasure in uh, doing the Princeton book of taking a look at uh, some of his papers, uh, which are now preserved at George Mason University. And here are his notes uh, from his dissertation research, what became his first book, Eight Hours for What We Will. And you, know, you can see just the joy that he um, expressed in discovering this particular newspaper article. A lot of his book is about leisure and the working class. And you know, here was a source saying exactly what he wanted to know, which was how did people in Worcester in 1912 think about taverns and class identity? And it turns out that, yeah, they wanted to shut down the taverns that were patronized mainly by laborers. Um, so you know, part of my work in the Princeton Guide is to try to figure out how can we have historians take notes this good while using computers? Because uh, you know, computers can do a lot of things. They can capture metadata, you can cut and paste, you can search more easily. But what we don't have, I think, is a system quite as simple as the one that people used in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s of note cards and notebooks and circling exciting phrases and writing lots of stars and learning that way. So that's something that is sort of a continuing interest of mine is how to um, take good notes myself and how to help others, especially students, learn how to take notes uh, for their own projects. Uh, one last thing I will say about digital technology, of course, is it has uh, greatly expanded dissemination. Obviously, I'm talking to you all uh, through digital technologies that did not exist um, you know, decades ago and were not even uh, particularly widespread uh, just a few years ago. Um, suddenly, you know, here we are um, in the future sharing with each these ideas with each other across the airwaves. So um, that brings me uh, to the importance of storytelling, which is the final section of the Princeton Guide and, and was uh, probably the most fun to write because we all love good stories, right? Uh, this has been you know, something of a debating point among historians, uh, certainly since the early 19th century, I can trace it that, at least that far back, which is, uh, should we write history as a science? Right in the sort of dry but very methodological and clear tones that you might expect uh, in, say, sociology or economics or political science, one of the one of the uh, other social sciences, or are we trying to tell good stories, um, the way that journalists and uh, writers of popular nonfiction might? And uh, the answer, of course, is ideally both. Um, but there's always a trade-off when you try to do uh, two things at once. Um, I will say that I myself. Uh, tend to be more of a lumper than a splitter in this regard. Um, a lot of the scholarship I read, I think, actually does a, a reasonably good job at storytelling, could do better. Um, a lot of the popular um, uh, nonfiction history that I read, I think, could, you know, with, with a few tweaks, um, be a little more analytical. And there are many books that do both just brilliantly well. Um, and so just a little bit of attention to storytelling can go a very long way. Um, there are lots of tips about um, how to tell better stories. Um, I was fortunate enough at Mason to co-teach a course with a colleague, Scott Berg, who's in the English department, a magnificent writer of historical nonfiction, but someone who you know, trained as a journalist um, uh, more than as a historian. And he helped me a great deal in thinking about what I needed to do to tell the story of Philadelphia's riots. Um, setting scenes, for example, how do you describe a place? And when you're describing it, can you maybe even give some hints of what's going to happen, right? So um, is there a sense of dread or a sense of hope or, you know, what's going on with the mood of that place? Um, another one, uh, of course, is uh, dialogue. Um, and this is one of the things that really kept me at the Philadelphia Project is 1844 was a long time ago. So you wouldn't think you'd be able to capture that much dialogue. But in fact, people 
spent a lot of time in court testimony and diaries and letters to the newspaper saying, so-and-so said this. And so I have a lot of at least approximations of dialogue that I could work into the story. Um, character development, of course, uh, you know, one of the big um, essential components of a good popular history is that you've got people that you care about, that the reader is going to care about, and whose fate the reader is going to care about. Um, how many characters do you have? Do you have one central character? Do you have two, um, three, four is what I ended up with for the Philadelphia story. Um, that's kind of pushing it, but some people have six, some people have 12. Um, but you know, the best popular histories have characters, and really I think the best scholarly histories do as well, even if um, you, know, you can only get little snippets of their lives because of the limits in sources. Um, and you know, part of that character development is not only telling what people were like, what they looked like, and you know, what their hobbies were, but also what they wanted out of life. Um, I, I compare this to a Broadway show where a character comes on and they sing an I want song. So, you know, George Kidwallader, you can see him um, as a member of one of the Philadelphia's most elite families, but really not very interested in the sort of standard civic engagement expected of him as a Philadelphia gentleman. So he goes into the militia and is going to do his noblesse oblige that way. Or you have Francis Patrick Kenrick, an Irish immigrant. Uh, who is appointed Bishop of Philadelphia. And you can see him wanting to have a uh, greater space for Catholicism in Philadelphia, ideally schools, but churches as well. So he builds lots of churches. How do these different characters interact um, given their various wants? Um, big part of storytelling is knowing what to, what to leave out. Um, at one point I, I sent a draft book proposal to a friend of mine who writes novels and screenplays and, and he had uh, chapter summaries and he sort of wrote back, well, these chapters, uh, they, they seem kind of boring. And um, I cut them, right? I, I, I combined them with other chapters, whatever. He said, you know, get to the point where people are, are trying to kill each other uh, as soon as you can. And that was, uh, that was pretty good advice. So uh, we have a lot to learn about uh, storytelling. And um, again, there's a lot to learn, I think, from uh, some from novelists, more from journalists. Uh, I love reading the work of investigative journalists in particular and thinking about how they take lots of documents and turn it into a compelling story. Uh, the last point I want to make is to stress how much fun this all is. Uh, if you think about people's hobbies, right, some people collect things, uh, stamps and baseball cards or antiques or spoons. Uh, some people like to solve puzzles and mysteries, jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles, whodunit stories. Um, some people like to assemble things. Uh, if you make quilts or model airplanes, right, you're taking small pieces and putting them together. And, uh, and then there are some people who like to tell stories, sit around a campfire, toast some marshmallows, tell ghost stories, that's fun. What if you got to do all of those things at the same time, right? What if you got to collect and solve a puzzle and put things together and tell a story? Well, then you're doing history. And I really um, don't know of anything else um, that combines all of those in quite the same joyous package. So my point here is that you can enjoy history as a spectator sport, right? Just as you can watch sports on TV and, and see the professionals do it and enjoy their achievement, you can sit at home and uh, buy books and, and read magazines and um, absorb your history that way, uh, let the professionals do it, and, and that's great. Um, but you can also be a participant. And history is wide open. There are always more stories to tell. There are always more questions to be answered. And there are these wonderful institutions, uh, Library Company of Philadelphia, prominent among them, that are you know, there to welcome you and show off the materials you have and help you answer the questions that you want to tell. Um, so the people of the past have made their choices, and they are waiting for you to tell their stories. So have fun at it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, to our audience, please feel free to add some uh, questions to the Q&A box or to the chat, and I will pose them to Zach, but I will get started. Um, I would like to talk to you a little bit more about project management, um, and especially about project management techniques that historians used in the past. So as I was telling you earlier, before I joined the library company, I was a longtime curator at the Morgan Library and Museum, where I worked with things like a thousand page manuscript of Washington Irving's Chronicle of the Conquest of Granada, and notebooks of Thomas Babington Macaulay, 
and um, Henry David Thoreau's research notes on, you know, his observations of nature. Um, how, to what degree did you investigate the strategies of historians of the past who were working with, um, you know, notebooks and pens and paper? And what did you find about their strategies and how they're much the same or different from the strategies we can employ today? Yeah, so I, you know, I think there's probably more work to be done here um, using especially historians' collections, um, that is, papers left by historians. Uh, in doing my work on the riots, um, I'd originally planned a, a longer uh, span of writing, and I found out that a historian named David Middle Madison had uh, tried to do this uh, in the early 20th century, in 1900 or so, and had never finished the book. Um, turns out writing about riots is really hard, but that's another story. Um, but he had left his papers at the Library of Congress. And so, you know, I went in there, again, a good hundred years or so after he had done his work. And I was able to figure out exactly what he was doing because it was so similar to, you know, the way I had been trained and the methods I used, where you take notes on, you know, one source at a time. He was working his way through Niles Weekly Register, which was a, a national magazine of the 1830s. And Every time he saw a riot, he would take a note and then he would sort those notes and do a timeline and try to build the timelines into chapters and the chapters into books. And, um, uh, you know, I, I know you had another of these fireside chats. I'm trying to remember that which author it was who was talking about how um, he had looked at a previous historian's manuscript again, I think about the revolution. Um, was it Michael Haddam? I, I think it might have been. Um, uh, saying, oh yes, you know, here's a draft that someone was circulating to a friend for comment, and that's just what we do today as well. So, um, you know, some of this uh, goes back, again, I think there's some things that Thucydides was doing, interviewing veterans of the Peloponnesian War that are very similar to what historians are doing today. A lot of this goes back uh, to the early 19th century uh, with Leopold von Ranke, who's often credited as inventing archival research. And I, I think there are reasons for that. Um, as uh, scholars have pointed out, uh, prior to Ranka, an archive was a, a government institution that was only open to government officials. And Ranka said, well, you know, I'm a historian. Can I look at your archive? And they said, well, maybe. Uh, he had a letter of introduction from Metternich and that helped. Um, and so I think, you know, at least since the 1820s, 1830s, um, historians' methods have changed less than you might think. Um, they're, they're basically trying to, uh, you know, build a chronology and then figure out, you know, where are the turning points in the story, where are the conflicts, where people disagree, where are the cases where evidence points me in a different direction, I have to reconcile um, what I think actually happened, and then uh, break that into chapters and build that into, you know, standalone articles or uh, full-fledged books, or in some cases, multi-volume books. But I really, you know, I fundamentally believe that if historians of, of previous centuries, um, again, Ronco or Edward Gibbon or someone were to somehow tune into this webinar, uh, they would not be terribly surprised by what historians do, um, that it is the same basic project. And again, I think you can do, you know, they were doing powerful white men, right? Kings and generals, like that's, that was their vision of what history was. but if you try to write the life of Martha Ballard, a midwife on the American frontier, uh, you've got a lot of the same challenges, right? You're trying to figure out who she was, what choices she made, what the turning points in her life were, and you know what she herself believed about the world. And so I, I do think that um, there's a lot more continuity than change in historians' methods. Well, thank you for that. Um, one of the um, strategies that you talked about was asking what came before. And we have a question in the chat about what came before the nativist riots of 1844. And the question is, did the Lombard Street riots of 1842 influence um, the 1844 riots? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, riots uh, come in waves. Um, and we've basically been through one in 2020 where, um, you know, whatever way, riots, protests, urban violence, civil disorder, whatever there was, there were uh, National Guard uh, mobilizations in over 30 states in 2020 to try to keep order in the streets. Um, we hadn't seen anything like that 
uh, since the late 60s and early 70s. You know, of course, the long hot summers starting from 1964 and going through 1968, and then there were some, you know, ends of that with Kent State and others. And um, so we see these waves, and, and uh, really the first big wave was the one that started in 1831 uh, in various places um, and continued uh, really into the 1850s. Um, most of these riots uh, did concern either attacks on African Americans, as was the case in Lombard Street, or attacks on abolitionists, uh, such as the burning of Pennsylvania Hall in Philadelphia. Um, but there were others as well. There were uh, labor riots. Um, there were anti-immigrant riots, like the one I write about. Um, there were riots over things like um, uh, railroad tracks in the street. Uh, there were election riots, um, some of them quite violent. And Americans at the time just didn't know what to do. Um, there were very uh, few police officers in the country. There, there really wasn't a, uh, anything like what we have in a modern police force until 1845 in New York City and then Philadelphia uh, not long after. Um, and so people didn't know how to respond. Um, and uh, part of the question here was, uh, does the mob actually have some legitimacy? Uh, in Democracy in America, Alexis de Tocqueville writes about this. He says, look, if you really believe that majority rules, then maybe uh, the mob will rule. And he had uh, heard stories about this happening in Baltimore in 1812. Um, now, Tocqueville, of course, thought that no minorities should have rights, and he, he warned against the tyranny of the majority, but that's easier said than done. And so um, a lot of what happens in Philadelphia in 1844 is um, Philadelphia the Philadelphia establishment basically getting fed up and said, we, we've got to put a stop to this and we are going to use lethal, lethal force uh, for the first time. Um, so let's get into the archive for a minute. Um, I know one of the, I don't want to say challenges, one of the pleasures I think of the working in the 1840s is that you had so many different newspapers um, covering the same events from different points of view. Um, and you have to, you know, weigh all of that. But archives have points of view as well. And we have a question here from a local archivist um, wondering which of the Philly area's Catholic archives was most useful to your book on the riots and why? And how do those Catholic archives contrast with secular or other private archives? Yeah, so this is uh, where we, we get back to the digitization um, again, because the American Catholic Historical Society uh, working with Villanova University has done wonderful work. Um, so I, I never actually set foot in the Archdiocesan archives because so much of the material was already at the Villanova website and the parts that weren't, uh, it was actually easier for the archivist Patrick Shank to very kindly scan them for me and, uh, and send me what I needed. Um, and then um, in addition to archival sources, we have um, printed versions of things like uh, Bishop Kenrick's diaries and letters, um, translated thank you from the Latin, um, uh, so that made things a lot easier for me. Um, and so, you know, we have uh, through that a, a pretty good view of uh, Kenrick and of some of the Catholic establishment. Um, and, you know, of course, I, I try to give them voice um, there. What's much harder is to find uh, the view of the, you know, less uh, clerical Catholics, um, the people in the pews. Um, the Irish workers, the politicians. Um, there are some figures in the book, you know, who I would love to know more about. Uh, Hugh Clark was an Irish born alderman up in Kensington, and he plays an important role in the story. Um, we don't have, you know, any letters in his hand, at least that I could find. Uh, again, he gives some testimony that we have uh, captured in the newspapers. Um, there was a, a newspaper called, I think, the Irish Citizen, that was a secular newspaper for Irish Americans. Um, as far as I can tell, not a single copy of a single issue of that newspaper survives. Uh, there's a very famous uh, daguerreotype in the, uh, in the library company um, showing sort of the newspaper, one of the main newspaper buildings that had um, lots of uh, different newspapers there. And if you use a magnifying glass, you can see the billboard for the Irish citizen, but there's no newspaper left. Um, so that was frustrating to me. Um, that I couldn't get as many Irish voices as I can, but again, I was uh, able to uh, turn Kenrick into more of a character because he left uh, these letters and diaries. And this, of course, has been a challenge to historians, especially as historians have tried to get more interested in social history and women's history and the history, you know, from below, is that 
if you are a powerful person, if you are a general or a congressman or a bishop, um, you are much more likely to have access to, first of all, writing, that you're literate. Uh, second, you know, that you've got uh, writing materials and time to write. And third, that your papers will be preserved. So Cadwallader, you know, was carefully filing away all of his correspondence for posterity, at least some of it. Um, he probably wanted, you know, his story to be told. Uh, you know, Kenrick as well was saving all of his letters. Whereas, uh, you know, someone, well, not only, um, you know, was Hugh Clark uh, have less time, also his, his house was ransacked uh, during the riots. So um, this is a big challenge for historians, is how do we tell stories of the less powerful using the records left to us by the more powerful. Um, so, you know, again, if, if someone gets arrested and, and um, you know, that might be a, a working class person or an enslaved person, but suddenly we have a little bit of their voice uh, captured by the authoritative state. Um, so, you know, again, did what I could to get those voices, but it was never as much as I would have liked. I think we've covered all the questions in the chat. So I would just like to um, maybe add one value to your list of um, values that are important to the historian, and that is humility. Um, you were just talking about gaps in the, in the record, um, and that is something every historian has to face. Um, sometimes we know what is missing, sometimes we don't. You just described a newspaper, I think, that you know existed but doesn't survive in any copies. Um, you also talked about that moment of discovery that every researcher has now and then opening a folder or whatever and discovering something that we didn't know existed that maybe completely shifts our sense of something. Um, so how do you advise or do you address in the book um, that question of acknowledging gaps, acknowledging what you don't know, um, and perhaps leaving space for um, Leaving space for uncertainty. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I hope I talk about it in the Princeton book. I'm not sure I do. I know I talk about it in the, uh, the note on sources at the end of the Philadelphia book, um, because, uh, you know, as you say, there are all these newspapers, but we've also missing copies and there are missing voices. And, you know, I think there, there are actually different kinds of humility that a historian brings to the table. One is knowing that um, you probably didn't get everything right. And again, I, there's uh, one correspondent who read my Philadelphia book said, oh, uh, this character couldn't have been married at the time that you said he was. And indeed, you know, I had misread a document saying he was married soon after he came. And what does soon mean? One year, 10 years, whatever. Um, so there are some flaws, but there are also um, uh, gaps in an interpretation. Um, I once uh, had the chance to hear uh, Eric Foner um, uh, t teaching a class and, and he was, you know, Foner, of course, is a, the greatest scholar of reconstruction, uh, not only about what happened in the 1860s and 70s, but uh, the interpretation of Reconstruction from um, the uh, you know early years after Reconstruction through Gone with the Wind and how that story has been told and twisted and um, reinterpreted, and so he's telling the students you know here's how this person thought about Reconstruction, here's that person Reconstruction, and a student asked him, look, um, if all of these historians of previous generations uh, got this so wrong, what makes you think that your account is going to you know, stand the test of time. And Foner looked at her and he said, I don't think that. And he points to his, his teaching assistants. He says, I've got these graduate students who are sharpening their knives, you know, ready to shred my interpretation at the first chance. Um, and, you know, so there is that, knowing that future generations will think differently. On the other hand, you don't want to be nihilistic about it. Um, and I do have this lovely statement in there by uh, my late colleague, Larry Levine, saying, look, you know, it's something along the lines of, yeah, we don't quite get it right, but maybe we start to approach the truth. As we do one interpretation after another, ideally we're not tearing down everything that came before. Uh, we're building on it and we're getting ever closer uh, to some kind of truth. Um, obviously there are some you know, topics in history, um, slavery being a pretty obvious one, that are you know, so politicized um, and so relevant to today that there may never be a consensus, whereas other things, you know, we can kind of uh, agree a, a little more about what happened. Um, but yes, I think both in terms of knowing the facts um, and also coming up with an explanation that is persuasive to people, um, 
both of those are ideals that we can approach but never actually reach. Well said. And I also appreciate your um, acknowledging what Eric Foner said in that class, because I, I have noticed um, that he, you know, a person of such, such stature in the field does continue to learn and shift his, his views on things and continues to write uh, in new ways. Um, I think we can wrap it up for tonight, and I want to thank you so much. Um, this was an unusual type of talk for us in that you, you didn't focus so much on your Philadelphia book, but more on approaches to history and writing. And that's something that we um, really value at the library company. And I'm um, just really grateful to you for sharing um, your thoughts about what history is and how, um, how to write it and how to ask good questions. So um, thank you all for tuning in tonight. This talk will be uh, archived and available if you'd like to recommend it to others. It should be up in a few days. Um, and just please, please join me in uh, thanking Zach for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.